and um, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to read a passage that's probably very familiar to most of us where Paul talks about the body of Christ and, um, and uses the analogy of our physical bodies to talk about the unity that we have in the body of Christ. And I want to start reading in verse 12 and read through to verse 27. So Paul writes, The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts that the body Uh, of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Amen. In our church, we view covenant membership as a, as a dynamic covenant that we sign. It unites us in our relationship. We sign it every year, and usually in the beginning of the year, um, we preach through the points of our covenant. I decided not to do that this year because how many years have we been doing it? And, uh, and you know it. You could preach it. But instead, I wanted to talk um, about... What unites us? Just a kind of a series of messages talking about the unity that we have in our covenant and what are the things that unite us together as a church. And so far we've looked at the fact that Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17 said, you know, Lord, they are one as you and I are one. So Jesus' prayer unites us. You know, we don't have to look for that unity or create that unity When we are in Christ, we are united with him and with one another in Christ. And then last week we looked at the fact that we are united by the call that God has on us. That we've been called together to follow Jesus. Not just simply called as an individual. Christianity is a team sport. It's not an individual sport. That uh, that we are a team together. And and this morning I want to look at that concept. I want to look at what it means to be the body of Christ. And we know that Jesus only has one church, right? So there's no such thing as the first church, the second church, the third church. You know, and all the other things. There's only one church. 
And when we get to heaven, there's only going to be one church. And we call that church the universal church. All right? It's a church that, ex- that, that expands all time. So as people who've gone before us, people who are going to come after us, it expands everyone who has come to the Lord. So we could look at the membership of the church of Jesus Christ today and say, my goodness, it's millions upon millions today. But there's also a concept of the church being a local church, a covenant gathering of people in one locality. And so Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, to the church at Ephesus. You know, we have letters in the New Testament that were written to the church singular at a city. Now, the church in Ephesus, they estimate, could have been 50,000 people. Did they all gather together in one spot? No, they couldn't do that. Uh, Draw too much attention. But they were one church. And so we look at ourselves as the church singular of Jesus Christ expressed through our local covenanted fellowship right here in Pocasset. But we are united with all the other churches around us and around the world. And so what does it mean? Does Jesus have many bodies or one body? One body. And yet we together are the body of Christ with all the other churches, but we represent that body here, okay? So the key principle, the key biblical principle in this is the principle of of, uh, unity with diversity. We can call it individuality. But it's unity with diversity. We are individuals. We're called to follow Jesus Christ, and we make a decision as individuals to follow that. You can't follow Jesus because your great-granddad was a pastor. It doesn't work that way. We come to faith individually, and yet our faith is expressed as a body. And so um, there's that individual aspect. But as Americans, we all tend to think of things as individual. You know, it's about me. I live in a consumeristic culture. What's in it for me? And yet when we look at the body we realize that it's not what's in it for me, it's what's in it for the Lord. What do I bring to Jesus? And we come to faith as individuals, but we are also in the body. And so what does it mean to be the body of Christ? Do we lose our identity? No. Does our identity stick out more than anybody else? And and it's like, I need to be the best. No. Because there's only one head, and that head's not me. It's Jesus. The head's not you. It's Jesus. And we are his body. In in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is dealing with what does it mean for the Corinthian church to be the body of Christ. To understand that, you need to understand a little bit of historical background of the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was a wild place to be. It was a happening place in many ways. You know, their worship services, you know, uh, were were exciting and dynamic, but they had issues. It was a church that had issues. Issues like, you know, there was open fornication going on. You know, um, a guy was living with his father's ex-wife, his stepmother. And, you know, I mean, that's a major issue. And it was public, and everyone knew it. There were issues going on there where they were, there was chaos during the services where they would have communion, and they had communion a little bit different than the way we did. They would share a meal together, I mean, a sit-down meal together, and then share communion during that meal. And people were getting drunk before you had communion. Corinth was a wild place. They, they really, they were charismatic in their giftings, but they didn't show wisdom in terms of how to do that because in the city of Corinth, the pagan worship was also charismatic. And so uh, they, they brought that with them, and, and Paul had to address that. Families were out of order, and there were divisions. There were people in the church who were saying, I, I'm following Peter. And other people will say, I'm following this leader, and I follow Paul, and I follow, you know, Chloe, and I follow. And, you know, they were talking about who they were following. 
And uh, do you know what the primary issue that Paul dealt with in that church, with all those? Which one would you start with? You would probably start with the fornication, right? <laughs> Should not to do that. <laughs> And Paul dealt with that. But the first one he started with, and the theme throughout the entire book of Corinthians, is division. He said, uh, starting in the very beginning, you say that there are, you're, you're following these different people. He says, is Jesus divided? What do you think you're doing? He says, there's only one foundation that's been laid, and that's Jesus Christ. And we build upon that foundation, and we're going to be judged by how we build. And he talks about relationships. And, and, you know, and he gets to the place where he's talking about communion. And, and he says, when you come to the Lord's table, some of you aren't even waiting for others to arrive. Now, there are people who are free, and there are people who are slaves. The slaves, you know, they had to work all day. And the guys who were business owners who had freedom, they would gather early and they'd have their own happy hour and they'd be drunk before the, 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 the Christians who were slaves arrived. And he says, that's division. Don't do that. In fact, the word division in the Greek means heresy. And so heresy isn't just impurity of doctrine. It's causing schisms within the church. And, and Paul is dealing with that and and as he deals with that, he comes to this section where he says, don't you realize that you are one body in Christ? You're not several bodies. You're one body. And he uses that analogy of what it means. You know, our physical body is one body. You know, uh, when we get up in the morning, our arms don't decide to go someplace else. <laughs> they come with us. And if they aren't coming with us, we got issues. <laughs> and so Paul says, and I want to look at this one body, many parts, and I want to look at the implications, and I want to spend a lot, a lot of time with this because the analogy kind of speaks for itself. But in, in verse 13, you know, he says, verse 12, the body is a unit, though they are made up of many parts, many individuals, and though all the parts are many, they form one body. We form one body in Christ. In verse 13, he says, For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, male or female, Republican or Democrat, Asian, European, African, American, it doesn't matter. We were all baptized into one body. And we were given the one spirit to drink. What does that mean? Baptized by one spirit into one body. Let me read over that and we go, ah, oh, that's cool. When we came to Jesus Christ, we were baptized into the body of Christ. Whether you were part of a local church or not, you became part of the church universal. You became a member of that church. You don't have to sign anything. You commit your life to Jesus Christ and you become a member of that church. We were all given of one spirit to drink. Remember when Jesus in John 7, uh, you know, came, he was at the temple in Jerusalem and they were doing um, a, a ceremony for the remembrance of Pentecost, which was the giving of the law of Moses. And the priest would bring a bowl of, of water taken from, you know, a stream and he would, you know, pour it out on, on the temple steps. And it was symbolic of the giving of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus stood up Everyone who's thirsty, hot summer day in Israel. Everyone who's thirsty, come to me. Or if you come to me, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That was the Holy Spirit. We were given one spirit to drink so that out of us, the same spirit would flow 
in ministry and witness to others. You know, the body of Jesus Christ is supernatural. I want you to think for me. I'm going to give you an analogy. In Genesis chapter 2, it talks about how God created Adam. You can go read that later. But when God created Adam, remember what he did? It says that God took the dust of the earth, took mud, molded Adam's body out of the dust of the earth, right? And then what, remember what it said? He said he took that body and he breathed on it, Ruach, the breath of God, the spirit of God, and that Adam became a living being. Adam became a living being, the dust of the earth forming a body energized by the breath of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and Adam became a living being. Supernatural. And everyone who has been born from that time is a combination of the physical dust of the earth and the Spirit of God giving us life. You know, how do you define life? You can't define it biologically. There's something more to life than just simply biological because we are made in the image of God. Now, I want to ask you something. How did the body of Christ become alive? The church. When's the birthday of the church? Day of Pentecost. What happened on the day of Pentecost? The body was brought together. Those who had believed in Jesus they had been waiting for 10 days in Jerusalem. They were praying together. They were fellowshipping. They were sharing meals together. They were discovering, you know, where they came from. They, they, they were of one accord, one body on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And then that day, early in the morning, there was a wind that came, and it blew. And the Spirit of God settled and, 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 and settled upon each one of them and filled them. And it was the body filled and energized with the Holy Spirit that brought the body of Christ, the church, alive. The church is supernatural. We need to recognize that, that we are supernatural, that, that we are not just a collection of people who happen to believe in Jesus, who got out of bed on a Sunday morning and came here because Paul was playing the drums, and we just love Paul playing the drums. And by the way, we do love Paul playing the drums. And I think our worship team does a great job. But we're the supernatural body of Jesus Christ, filled with his spirit. We're not just simply a committee of people. And we're united as that body of Christ, even though we are many members. We are a team. Now, today is Super Bowl Sunday, Patriots in the Super Bowl. I have to bring the Patriots into the message. <laughs> Could you stay on this? <laughs> Why don't you think with me for a minute? Very first Super Bowl they won. Do you remember how they came out on the field? All together as a team. No one ever done that before. Before they were individually introduced. I'm playing in the Super Bowl. You know? But they said no. No superstars. We're a team. How have they, in the past 15 years, had seven Super Bowl appearances and won four? Because they're a team. They were unified. They have developed a culture that says, we are a team, we're not individuals. And you listen to Brady speak, and he's always saying, it's not me, guys, it's everybody else. You listen to anyone when they go before, uh, you know, the, 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 the news people and they share, they're always lifting one another up. And, you know, there are some strong Christians on the Patriots. But Belichick has developed a culture of unity based on the fact that we are a team. Do you know that that's what Jesus did for his church? We are a team. And two weeks ago I said, we're in this together. We are. And Jesus is in our boat. That makes all the difference. So, you know, you think about the Patriots. In any play that happens, who's the most important player? Brady throws a pass. It could be a perfect pass, but if it's not caught, it doesn't mean anything. The guy has to catch it. 
The blocker has to block in order for the guy to get in the right place to catch it. The whole team has a job to do. And what have we heard Belichick's motto being? Do your job. Do your job. He says, if everyone does their job, we win. Now, we can look at that and we say, well, the body of Christ, if everyone does the job that God has for you, we win. Now, that job, we're going to be talking more about that later on this year. That job is not just simply the things you do on a Sunday morning. It's far broader than that. It's not just simply the tasks that we do, you know, to, to keep the physical building going and the stuff that we do. There's a deep-seated calling. Some of us are eyes. Some of us are ears. Some of us are hands and feet. You know, we are different parts of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ, the purpose for the body of Christ is to represent Jesus in the world. And we all play different roles in that, 24-7. And as we do our job, the job that Jesus gave us, we win. So we're one body, but we have many parts. By the way, Tom Brady's Super Bowl ring is no bigger than the Super Bowl ring of the guy who's on the special teams to return kicks, the kickoffs, that he's out there maybe, you know, a total of 30 seconds a game. He gets the same size Super Bowl ring that Tom Brady gets. Yeah. And the third quarter, you know, the third string quarterback, you know, who got to play two games this year, whether he played any games or not, he still gets a Super Bowl ring because he's a part of, of the team. So, can you hear that? Verse 18 says, God has arranged, says, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So, we don't get to pick our position. He already has. And he's picked our position based on the gifts and the personality, and the things that he's placed within us to fulfill that call. And some of us are going to be reaching out into the community in very significant ways, bringing the love of Christ. Some of us are going to be, you know, helping people one-on-one, -on -one, uh, hidden, unseen, deal with the issues of life to bring wholeness to them. Some of us are going to be teaching classes. Some of us who say, don't ever put me in front of a class. I can't do that. No, you've got a different job. You follow what I'm saying? We're a body. We're one body with many members, and every one of us are different, and we need to cheer one another on. This is Tom Brady cheers on the unsung heroes on his team. Verse 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You, plural, us, we're the body of Christ, and you're a part of it. Melanie, you're a part of it. You're a part of us. And if you're not here, we are lacking. Diane, you're a part of the body of Christ. One body, many members, you're a part of it. You're significant. You've got a role to play. Every single one of us does. And there are going to be people who are going to come to the Lord this year. I believe it that they're going to be people who are going to put their trust in Jesus, and it's going to be so exciting to see someone who's a new Christian, who all this is brand new to, and you're going to share some simple truth that everyone knows this, and they're going to go, huh? Never heard that before. Really? Let me tell you about it. And we're going to be adding to the body of Christ because this is a supernatural body. It's what unites us together. So, Romans 12, 5. I put that as the verse of the week. It basically says, we belong to one another. So, Marion, you belong to me and I belong to you as the body of Christ. All right? So, Chuck, we're connected. We belong to one another. What does that mean? It means that we're tied together in covenant and when one person succeeds, we all succeed. And when one person is hurting, we all hurt. And when one person is persecuted, we're all persecuted. 
And when one person is in victory, we're all sharing that victory. We are a team. If the team doesn't win, you can't. Right? No superstars. Just one, Jesus. So what are the implications? I kind of touched on them already. One implication is God has arranged our functions. How we function is what God has determined. By the way, our identity is not our function. What you do is not who you are. The position you hold is not who you are. We are sons and daughters in Jesus. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Our identity is rooted in Jesus. Our function is what God has planned for us. That's the good works he's planned for us from the foundations of the world. Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship. And he didn't create me to be a linebacker. I'm not big enough. He didn't create me to be an NBA football, uh, basketball player. I may want to. I may envy those who play, but it's not, not going to be me. You know, and you can look at yourself and you say, well, he didn't create me to be this and this and this. No, but he created you to be something. He created you for a purpose. And, and God has arranged us. And if we can discover how God has arranged us together and we get in the right places, could you imagine what would happen with the body of Christ functioning in unity? What would happen if your, a part of your body, you woke up one morning and a part of your body decided not to obey you? Or decided that they were going to go someplace else? <laughs> one foot says, I'm not working today. I'm going to go to Florida. You can stay here. You know, it, 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 it wouldn't happen. But the parts of our body obey us. Our, our mind says, hand, do this. And it does that. Foot, move. And it does that. Some of us, it works better than others. But our, our body obeys our head, right? You know, an implication of this is if we're the body of Christ, then Jesus is glorified when the parts of his body obey him. Very simple truth. If the parts of our body weren't obeying us, it would be because there is a disease, right? Paralysis. Something's not working right. We stub our toe, and all of a sudden, our toe becomes very, very important to us. <laughs> we ignored it all week until we stub it, and then it becomes extremely important. You know, if our body were to disobey our mind, we would look really funny and we would not be able to function. The same thing is true of the body of Christ. We need to obey the head. We need to learn, you know, that that becomes our first response. Lord, what are you saying? What are you doing? You know, I was, people are going to have guests over tonight. And I said to someone this morning, you know, pray that you'd be a witness to those who don't know Jesus. Because that's what it means to obey Jesus. So, God has arranged our functions. Jesus is honored and glorified. When we do our job, we obey him. We are unified as a team for a purpose. And that purpose is to make disciples of all nations. That purpose is to represent Jesus. As Jesus is glorified in his body, so we get to carry that glory and extend it into our community. We represent him in our witness. And another implication is we are mutually dependent upon one another. We're not individuals. We're a body. We have individual identity. We have a, a role to play. But we're a body. We're a team. And we are dependent upon one another. We want to be a body without need. We read about in the early church. We want to be a body that cares for one another. We want to be a body that reaches out, that, that, that doesn't exclude other people, but that includes other people. We want to be a body of Christ where the supernatural of love of Christ is being seen 
as we express it to one another. And you know what? We all are difficult people to love. I admit I am. That's my wife. <laughs> you know, we, we are. The issue is not, well, you stepped on my toe. She didn't say hi to me. I didn't get invited to that party. You know, we need to just get over that and say, we're body of Christ. And if someone is not acting correctly, we pray for them. We don't condemn them. We prefer one another rather than wanting other people to prefer us. We're body. We're a team. We have been constituted by Jesus Christ. We are mutually dependent. I want to close with a, an illustration from a book. And I tried to find the book this morning. I couldn't find it. But C.S. Lewis wrote a short book called The Great Divorce. And it's not about marriage. <laughs> Don't worry about that. It's a fantastic little book where there is an imaginary bus ride from people who are on the outskirts of hell, this is after they died, going to the outskirts of heaven and meeting people who are Christians and uh, in conversations that occur in them. And one scene has this person through his, who, whose eyes that were seeing this. He's taken the bus ride. And he's with a guide and he asked this angel guide, he says, uh, who's that woman over there? Arrayed as a queen. Just glowing with glory. Walking. You know, children are following her. Animals are following her. She's just like a queen. Regal. And he said, she must have been someone really important in her earthly life. The angel said, no, she wasn't. She was just... A housewife. She taught Sunday school. She discipled children to Jesus Christ. Well, then why is she dressed like a queen? That's the glory of God. Because she fulfilled her purpose on earth. Do you know, there will be a day where we're going to share in Jesus' glory. And it's not going to be based on the American metric of how big was your business? How big was your church? What kind of great things did you do? Are you listed in who's who? No, it's going to be, did you do your job? And the, and the accolade is going to be, well done, good and faithful servant. We are a body of Christ. We are called to one another. We are called to the greatest mission this world has ever seen, to make disciples of Jesus. And we're called to do it together. So let's be that body. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have saved us by your grace. Amazing grace. That we belong to you. We belong to one another. You made us one body. We are united because of your call, because of your salvation, because you have energized us and infused us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to live that out. Remind us every day that we are a team for you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. in the midst of the excitement tonight I had some time this week to really ponder on what I shared with you um, let's stand for our benediction taking it from Romans chapter 12 verses 9 through 12 love must be sincere hate what is evil 
cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in infliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Father, dismiss us, Lord, with your blessing. Enable us to be the body of Christ and to fulfill those things that you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. And go Patriots. <laughs>